Welcome everyone to the service of worship with the Lorraine Avenue Mennonite Church in this season of Lent. I remind you to keep your mics muted and your cameras off, except as directed. I invite you to light a candle, as I have done, to represent God's presence among us, even as we are dispersed. Will you join me in the call to worship? I will read the light type and ask you to join in reading the bold. God, you ask us to set our minds on you, to walk before you and be blameless. You teach us what matters and you do not hide your face from us. With each step along the path, we are transformed into what you made and called us to be. God, you teach us that when we lose our life, we save it. With each step along the path, we hope against hope in your promises. God, you say you will make us exceedingly fruitful, that you will bless us. With each step along the path, we take up our cross and follow you. We believe your everlasting covenant is to be God with us and that we will live forever. We call out to you as you call us into, for, into this covenant. And now join me in the time of confession. Um, if you are comfortable, turn on your cameras and join in singing, bless the Lord my soul in the voices together number 127 or as you find it in the attachment to the bulletin. Ooh. 
Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Together. God, this is about the secret sins which we have managed, we think, to conceal from others, but which are an open book to you. You see the sly dishonesty, the creeping pride, the selfish preoccupation, the lustful thoughts, the abusive actions, the crooked business dealings, the tight-fisted stinginess, and the fear of facing consequences we deserve. We have prepared a bitter table and sit alone. The unseen guest at every table surprises us with his invitation to a different banquet where bread and wine flow freely and where forgiveness counters all bitterness. We come, Lord Jesus, we're your guests. Let this food to us be blessed. Amen. And receive this assurance of forgiveness. Do not fear, says God, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God is doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Together, thanks be to God. And again, please turn on your cameras if you are comfortable and join in singing, Bless the Lord My Soul. And now for the time for children with Jill Robinson. Well, good morning. Um, I have brought some things to share with you that um, I'm going to see if you can identify what they are, okay? Some are very familiar and some uh, maybe not so familiar. Okay, we're going to start with an easy one. All right, here, I'll describe it for you in case you can't um, tell. Um, it's brown, it's hard, okay? It was outside and so it was really cold, but now that it's been inside, it's not as cold. Okay, ready? What is it? A rock, that's right. Okay, so um, the next one is a item here, an item is a lot bigger than that rock. See how long it is? Okay, it's made of wood. If I tried really hard, I could probably break it, but I don't want to do that. Okay, ready, what, do you, what is it? A stick, yes. So I might, you might call this a stick or you might call it a branch but it comes from a tree. Okay, here's something else that comes from a tree. Okay, this would be the outside of the tree. It's called bark. Mm-hmm, that's the tree bark. Okay, now here's some things that to listen to, okay? And these are some things that you might see in the trees, okay? And I'll, I'll reveal to you what it is. Actually, I will show you the picture. Okay, so this is a picture of a tree. All right, now listen. One more time. All right, do you know what kind of animal made that sound? I'm going to reveal it. 
that's a robin. A robin makes that sound, and so whoever made this book uh, recorded that sound of the robin and put it in there so we could hear it and see it. And here I have another, oh, let me find it, okay, which one is this? That's not the one I wanted, okay, this one here. This one you probably have seen in your backyard or maybe in parks, okay, but let's listen to it first. One more time. All right. Can you identify what that was? You might have heard the sound before. Here we go. Ready? That kind of bird is called a cardinal. And I can always tell when the cardinals are out because they're really bright red. At least the male cardinals are. Yeah. Oh, I'll leave that open. Okay. So those are two things that we can hear and maybe had to identify. Um, so far, have you had, have you needed any help putting names to these objects? Maybe, maybe not. Here's some that are probably, uh, two that probably you've seen before, maybe in your backyard, but um, maybe not. So this one here, let's see if I can get out of the glare. Okay, this one you might see scurrying around your backyard or in the parks, called a squirrel. Very good. Let's see if this. Oh no, you're not. Save that one for later because it's an unfamiliar one. That one too. Okay, here. Let me go faster. Okay, here's one. Oh, that was the one I wasn't supposed to show you. Well, anyway, we'll go with this one. Okay. This is actually a plant, and this is called a fiddlehead. All right, so if you've ever seen a fiddle or a violin or a viola or any kind of the string instruments where the top kind of goes up and swirls around, that's probably, I imagine, where it got the name because the top, this circular pattern looks like the fiddle, the top of the fiddle. So um, it's a type of a fern that people can go find in the forest and they can eat it. and. I hear it tastes really good, but I've never had one before. But there's others that look kind of like it, and I've heard those are just terrible tasting, so don't try those. Only look for the correct ones. But those are called a fiddlehead. All right. And then the last picture here. Oh, wait. No, I had two more pictures. Well, I'll just go with this last picture here. This is called, I know I don't want to tell you yet, I want you to try to guess. But it might be helpful if you see the picture better. There, that's good lighting. Okay, this is actually a very tiny creature, probably about that big, okay, in real life. In the picture, it's bigger, but in, in real life, it's really tiny. And this is called a pygmy shrew. So it's a very tiny uh, little mammal. And I think it's the smallest mammal of record on Earth. So um, that would be the pygmy shrew right there. Now, what do you suppose all these things have in common that I showed you and let you listen to? These are things that can be found in the woods. I know, who would have guessed? But um, these are things that can be found in the woods, and um, they sometimes we've might not be able to identify everything that's in the woods. Sometimes we need help to identify things that we see in the woods. Some things that you recognized right away, you didn't need help, but other things you had to ask for help, right? Because you didn't recognize those things right away. We had to ask our adults for help or wait for to hear what that item was. Okay, so how does this relate to our life? Um, our life can be like going into a forest or going into the woods because um, sometimes there are things that we recognize easily, right? Just like the stick and the, and the rock, okay? Uh, but other things we don't recognize as easily. They were a little more difficult. Uh, maybe we have to try something new and um, and that can be a little challenging because we've never done it before. But when you're trying something new and it's a challenge, um, 
like like when we were trying to guess these objects here, um, sometimes we need to ask other people for help because that can be um, of great use when we're trying something new and it's a challenge. Okay, when we experience unfamiliar situations, uh, such as going into the woods or maybe being a new um, a new person at a school that you've never gone to or joining a group of kids where um, you might not know everyone right away that can be a challenging situation but sometimes when we ex experience unfamiliar situations like that in life uh, we might be unsure about them but we can ask adults um, for help and we can ask for advice and we can um, trust that um, they will help us out. We can also ask the adults that God has placed in our lives for help. Uh, so I wonder who are some adults in your life that you can ask for help when you need it? Hmm. You think about that and um, come up with some really good uh, people who can help you because they will be there for you and most importantly we can talk to God and God will be there for us. Thanks. We come now to that time of the service when we would, if we were all together, we would be passing the plates and collecting the offering. We still want to pause to give our thanks to God and to recognize all that we've been given. And particularly, I want to say thank you to those of you who have been able to continue to support the church, um, even though you're not getting that regular reminder to pass as the plate gets passed. Let us pray to pray our prayer of thanksgiving. Creator spirit, you clothe the flowers of the field. Enable us to rejoice in all the gifts with which you fill us. And may that be enough for us. Amen. We have several scripture readings this morning. We will start with the Genesis chapter 17 verses one through seven. Ah, I'm sorry, I missed the hymn. I apologize. We're gonna go with our hymn, turn on your cameras if you're comfortable and join in singing Faith of the Martyrs in the Voices Together number 575 or um, in the attachments to the bulletin. Um 
And now for the scripture reading from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the, their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And then later, verses 15 to 22, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael may live in your sight. God said, no, but your wife, Sarah, shall bear you a son and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. No. Our next scripture is from Mark chapter eight, verses 31 to 38. Then he began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May God add his blessing to this reading. Good morning, everyone. I have to tell you that uh, every time I pick two scripture passages for the morning, it uh, very quickly becomes unwieldy. Uh, so many thanks to Judy for reading all those verses because there was a, there was a lot of them. Um, but I'm excited to talk about both of these passages today a little bit. Um, thematically, they fit very interestingly together. So uh, let's get into it then, right? When I was in seminary, I lived about 45 minutes away from my 
now my fiance, then my boyfriend, Albert. And I would sometimes pick him up from the train station that he would take so that he would only be like 20 minutes away. But I often drove from Princeton to Cherry Hill or from Cherry Hill back to Princeton. I did that drive quite a bit. And I drove down a road that is well known on the East Coast, I-95. It's kind of the road that you drive in that area. And usually a pretty uneventful drive. Usually I was on the road during off-peak hours because let's be honest, I did not sleep regular hours during seminary. I spent a lot of time making poor sleep decisions. But usually there were very few people on the road. One day, after I hadn't seen Albert for a while and he was unable to make it to the train to come see me, I decided kind of on a whim to go see him, even though there was snow in the forecast for later that day. And I saw him and we had a nice date night and then I got back in the car to drive home, right around the time the snow had started or perhaps it had been falling for a little bit. And as I drove up 95 toward Princeton, it started snowing more and more and more and more, and there was accumulation on the roads, there was low visibility, and suddenly my pretty good day, where I got to have a nice dinner with my boyfriend, turned pretty scary. And it was dark, and the snow was falling very fast, the road was slippery, my car was small, I never drive large cars, they're not made for snow. So I got pretty nervous, but I gritted my teeth and I kept going, and eventually I was kind of watching the lights of the cars in front of me, because none of us knew where the lanes were anymore. And I really didn't know how long it would take me to get home. And I started try considering, should I pull over, find a place to rest until the snow subsided. I'm a pretty stubborn person though, so I kept going. And as you can tell, I did eventually make it home safe and sound. Lent always seemed like a dark time in the Christian calendar, and it's a bit, I think, like driving home in a snowstorm. In the last few years, I've heard Lent referred to as the springtime of the soul, and I do like that sentiment. I think it is a time in which we cultivate new growth in our lives. But it still has this solemn, almost dour quality to it. Last week, Scott talked about the connection between Lent and this idea that maybe we are supposed to suffer like Jesus suffered, that's often taught to us. And Scott offered us the question that I interpret as, what if we're not called to suffer, but to thrive? And I really appreciate that question, and I think it's definitely true. We are not called to suffer as Christians for suffering's sake. We may suffer because of what Christ calls us to, but we are not called to suffer simply because Jesus suffered. Furthermore, suffering is not meant to be a primary feature of our lives. It's not something that we're just supposed to continually endure and endure and endure. Lent is indeed, though, a time where we may give some things up, scale back. We might try to remove some excess in our lives so that there's more room for God but it's not a time for pain for its own sake. Lent takes on this solemn feeling because we are called during Lent to ponder Jesus's ministry and eventually his last days on earth and his death on the cross. During Lent, we peer down the snow-covered road. We peer into the great mystery that is God incarnate dying a painful, violent death. From Ash Wednesday on, we are being propelled toward Good Friday, toward the darkest day of the church calendar, toward the mystery of this death that brings life. We know with 2,000 years of history and interpretation on our side that in his death, Jesus is glorified. And we too are called to lay down our lives to practice a certain level of detachment to this world. In this passage we read from Mark this morning, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For if whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. There is this connection between death and life. 
The connection was not entirely clear to Peter, and thus his rebuking of Jesus in Mark chapter 8. And though Jesus does call Peter Satan in this passage, which is a very intense moment, the fact is that in that moment, Peter joined a long line of biblical questioners. Take a look at the Genesis passage from this morning. Abraham remains silent through most of the passage, hearing God's promises, seemingly accepting them. But he falls down laughing when he is told he will have a child at 100 years old. I think I might fall down laughing too if I were told something like that. He asks how this could ever be possible. And Lent is a bit like that. During Lent, we are invited to ponder the mysteries inherent to a God who became incarnate for us. But we are not necessarily given clear answers, solid answers. In Lent, we are invited to join Peter and Abraham before him in this messy, complicated, not always clear work of following the ways of the kingdom of God. It's a bit like me trying to get home in the middle of a snowstorm. I knew the way, and I had the lights of the cars in front of me as a guide, but it was still very scary, disorienting, and even just like generally frustrating. I was very annoyed that I'd gotten myself into this situation. But the good news is I had another trick up my sleeve, and that trick ended up being singing. Initially, I thought when I started getting scared that maybe I could pray the rest of my drive home. I could ask God for safety, and that was a good sentiment. I'm, I was a good seminarian trying to pray my way out of this. But there are only so many ways that you can say, God, help me get home. And eventually, that wasn't really helping me feel any better. So I started singing. I started singing every single hymn I knew the words to, and if I didn't know the words, I just sort of hummed along until I remembered some more. And the more scared I got, the louder I sang until I was shouting as I was driving down the highway. And that shouted singing was my prayer. That music shouted in the dark was my prayer to get me through, my prayer that I wouldn't slide off the road or have an accident. And I made it home a little scared and a little exhausted from shouting, but happy to see my warm bed. And I like to tell this story for a few reasons. One, it's a very humbling story. If you were under any illusions that I was perfect before this, I think this story clears it up. I made a lot of poor decisions that evening. <laughs> Telling this story knocks me down a peg. But the other reason I tell this story, perhaps the more interesting reason, is because it reminds me that prayer does not always have to be flowery words or well thought out constructions. Sometimes prayer is singing at the top of your lungs in the dark because that's all you know how to do. Sometimes prayer is shouting at God because things don't make sense. Sometimes prayer is quiet reflection, no words, just silence and contemplation, waiting to see if God has a message for you. The Bible is full of stories about ordinary people encountering the extraordinary, and trying to make sense of it all. And if you have experienced God, perhaps you can relate to that. Sure, God's promises are all nice and comforting, but what happens when God's promises mean that you are called to the impossible, what seems impossible to you? Sure, Jesus' miracles and bold words calling for a radical new way of life are inspiring. But what happens when it turns out following those ways will lead to death? And maybe you're willing to die, but maybe, as the disciples find out, you're not willing to let your leader die. What happens when the rubber meets the road? Or rather, when the rubber can't meet the road because the road is covered in snow? What happens when you know the destination, but your path is dark and your way is blocked? What happens when you have heard God's voice, but the community you heard it in turns out to be imperfect? 
What happens when the leaders you know and trust end up being some of those very stumbling blocks on the snowy road? You find a way to keep showing up. You find a way to keep coming back because we believe, not even in our community or in the leaders that we love or rage against or reject, but we believe in God's promises, in the promise that somehow new life comes from death. Somehow miraculous births occur. Somehow there will be a resurrection and a better world, a world that casts out the grief and the pain and the separation so characteristic of our society, so characteristic of this time of COVID, a world that casts out sexual violence and harassment, a world that rises from the ashes of the old, a world that emerges dripping condensation as the storm abates, the sun comes out, and the snow melts. We know this. We, we know this truth. We know that we believe in God's promises more than these earthly things. We know that we must take up our cross, be willing to give things up, shake off that excess, even see the death of some things in order for there to be something new and living and growing. We know this, but I don't think we always like it. We want to reject that paradox that death now can mean a world later without death. We don't like the death, the passing away, the loss, the grief, the anger, the tears. We don't like seeing the ways we have enabled the ways we have averted our gaze, the ways we have kept hidden those secret sins that we confessed earlier, whether our own or those of others. We don't like to hear about it and we lash out at the prospect of death, any death of a dream, of a relationship, a self-image, an understanding of the past. It hurts to varying degrees and it feels foolish, even insensitive, to say, oh, but from that death, new life comes. To that, I often say, what if I liked the old life? Thank you very much. And the cross, this point we're driving to with all of Lent, doesn't give us a full answer a why to the question about suffering. But what it does give us is a God who suffers with us. The cross gives us a God who lived a truly human life, who loved us enough to live as one of us. We can com take comfort in the fact that God does know our pain. God has felt it. And the love of God is a healing, soothing balm for that pain. It knows how to take our broken, dying parts and put us back together. It knows how to bring new life, to bring us out of the storm. But this is hard to remember, hard to see, and sometimes hard to believe. It's true, but it might be hard to hold on right now. And here's the truth I will declare over and over again. If you can't hold it right now, that is okay. If you can't hold all of that right now, we will help. We, the community of faith, can hold this together. If all you have right now is a whole lot of death and no resurrection, congrats. You are in the right liturgical season. God is troubled by the pain of this world and is troubled with you. We are troubled with you. Somehow, God will be glorified through the cross. Somehow, Jesus will be raised by Easter morning. And somehow, you will be brought through this time to new life. And that new life won't negate the death, won't negate the pain that we felt. It won't tell us that we ought to forget Lent and ought to forget Good Friday. But it will tell us to move forward and live into the resurrection. We will get home. 
but we will remember the times when we had to shout in order to pray, had to keep silence in order to hear God, had to force ourselves to show up and hear these stories, push ourselves to continue to believe in the God of Abraham, the God of Sarah and Rachel and Leah and Ruth, Naomi, the God of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Esther and Peter and John and Paul and Mary Magdalene and Phoebe and Junia and so many others. We have this testament of faith before us that we can draw upon and continue to show up and believe in the God of these stories, the God of these people, the God of these ordinary folks who've encountered the extraordinary and are just trying to figure it out like us. So do not lose heart, dear ones, for Lent merely represents the snowstorm and the falling away of the excess. Let us allow Lent to do its work. Let us shout and sing and sit in silence whatever we must do to find God. Let us allow the old life to pass away. Let us sit in the dark of the tomb for a bit longer. And when the morning comes, let us be ready to move. Amen. Our hymn of response is, Will You Come and Follow Me? Found in Voices Together 540. It is also in Sing the Story. But in Sing the Story, it's only verses 1, 2, and 3. In Voices Together, it's 1, 4, and 5. I'm sure the Newmans will do a good job of leading us through it. <laughs> So we come now to the time for work of the church. And I think our recording is going to get paused here. I know that we have.
So may you go now and go with God, for you cannot go where God is not. Even when the road is dark, even when it is covered in snow. And go with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go in love, for love alone endures. And my friends, go in peace, making peace with one another, building peace in our world, knowing that there is hope in the resurrection. Go in peace. Amen.